Okay, I guess it's starting right now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Yes, okay, sir. great. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's certainly an honor to be here, and thank you for that uh, introduction. I did want to start with a shout out to the, what I've just heard, the four uh, speakers, but also the two musical events. I guess I was writing down things like brilliant, inspiring, challenging, thought-provoking, thought and also sobering in some cases, some of the uh, presentations in terms of some of the issues that uh, that, that we face in Pakistan and certainly beyond as well. Uh, the music was also great. Um, I think on occasions like this, all that you can really say is <laughs> fantastic. I mean, just, just both of them were, were, were really wonderful. Um, I've called this uh, talk, Seven Steps, Following a Path Toward Pakistan. Uh, and of course it draws on that uh, first comment, one step forward, which is the theme of tonight. Um, at first I thought, well, this is about one momentous decision or perhaps a, a life-changing event or something that people have faced, uh, sometimes even a, a life-threatening event and how that teaches you the fragility of life and how that certainly uh, affects you in all kinds of ways. Uh, maybe one could talk about a physical or spiritual challenge as well. Um, but then of course I did think about, well, my recent step forward was to come to Pakistan. Uh, so I thought, well, maybe that's the one I should talk about, one step forward, this uh, uh, you know, coming, coming, coming to Pakistan. Uh, but then I also thought, well, maybe just that one step is too limited because everything that we do is built on previous steps. And I guess this is how I came across this sort of seven steps forward. Uh, actually, seven steps, all of them spent in Pakistan, uh, which shaped my life into what it, uh, uh, what, what it is today. Um, at a more maybe trivial level, I don't know if they, any of you played this in your childhood, but when I grew up, there was a game called Mother May I? And uh, you sort of started off in the courtyard and then you know, someone said, take two giant steps forward or two baby steps or whatever. And you could take those. Um, but if you didn't say first, uh, mother may I, you were sent back to the beginning of the line. And I don't know if this is supposed to be a children's game that's supposed to teach you patience or uh, maybe politeness or maybe obey your parents. Maybe that was the lesson, mother may I. <laughs> Uh, but the reality is, uh, you know, it was a game of steps forward and steps back, which I think maybe in some ways was a precursor to life. Uh, this notion of, I've titled my talk, Seven Steps uh, uh, Following a Path Toward Pakistan, um, I suppose it also draws on other books uh, that I've read. Uh, one of them is a book called 39 Steps. I don't know if anybody's heard of it. It's a Scottish author, uh, John Buchan, uh, basically a crime thriller, which is kind of interesting. Uh, there's also a, actually a wonderful book uh, by the Trappist monk, um, uh, Merton, Thomas Merton called The Seven Story Mountain. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's funny, my father said many years ago that this was a book that inspired him. It's a remarkable story uh, many decades ago, but I think um, uh, it's interesting to read. And of course, there's also bestsellers that uh, some people may have been introduced to and are often in business school curriculum, seven, uh, seven Habits of Highly Effective People. So this number seven, I think, is also kind of reviewed as, um, as, as, as sort of a perfect number, if you will. Um, but anyway, I think that what is true is that, you know, as we take these steps in our life, uh, we do tend to look back. Uh, and that gets me into this image of, of you know, the, the, the path forward is sometimes obscured by mountains. We see clouds up ahead. However, looking back, at least for me, there's, there's been a pattern. And I think it's, 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 it's remarkable and in some ways inspiring. Uh, some ways we look back and we think both, some of those steps might have been even foreordained. Um, what it does remind me of, I don't know if anybody has heard this expression, but it's the, the great Danish theologian, Soren Kierkegaard, who basically said, life must be lived forward, uh, but understood backwards. Uh, and maybe as you grow older, you look back and you have longer to look back on, maybe it becomes more compelling or more real. Uh, but this notion that uh, life must be lived forward, but understood backwards, I think is, is, is one that's been a hallmark in my life. Um, that one comes from Kierkegaard. There's a couple, I don't know if I'm stealing them from somebody else, but I think I invented them because they've also been touchstones in my life. Uh, one is that we are what we remember. Uh, and for me, uh, in my life, looking back, this notion of memory is important. Um, and then another one, and I think it was uh, the, the issue of hope, I think was mentioned by our first speaker. And one of my comments there is because I try to look at the positive is I'll take hope wherever I can find it. Uh, and sometimes it's hard to find, uh, but I will always find that hope wherever uh, you know, wherever it is. Um, the reality is, of course, when you think like that, it does root, root your time, your, your, your existence in this wrinkle of time, uh, your life on earth uh, to where you start, which of course, everybody had a starting journey um, before, uh, you know, from my perspective, those first steps even started before I learned to walk. 
because um, you know life did become a series of steps forward, a series, uh, sort of chapters, if you will. Um, what I thought I would do would be to look back on that um, uh, that life, if you will, uh, those chapters, and focus for me on the chapters that I since. The, this is an introduction kind of thing, is to focus on the, the chapters I spent in Pakistan. Um, I actually used that image uh, the last time before now when I was in Pakistan, which was after the earthquake. And I talked to our staff before I left. And uh, one of the things when I finished my remarks is I said, I've spent all these chapters of my life, I think there were seven that I enumerated at that time. And I said, I'm not so sure I don't have one more chapter to spend in Pakistan. And in any case, that's what I, um, uh, I, I sort of said more as a joke, perhaps, not realizing that 13 years later, 12 years later, I would be back in Pakistan. So let me again go through some of those, uh, those comments uh, that, that has brought me here, brought me back to Foreman. Uh, the first step, if you will, was that birth and childhood in Pakistan. Uh, if you want uh, to say the um, mother may I game, it was the longest and biggest step of all uh, because it was the first 18 years of my life. And uh, sometimes I look back and think that's kind of improbable. Um, I've always told people that, um, uh, that children, and I thought about our own kids as well, you are incredibly lucky and privileged, or at least parents, if they can, should try to give kids an early sense for uh, the physical beauty of the world around you. And uh, I felt I was very fortunate uh, to have that in Murray, uh, to grow up and see the, in, the, in a very clear day, actually, in, in those days, at least you could see Nanga Parbin in one direction, and of course the Pier Panjal Range and Kashmir in the other. So again, I was fortunate to have uh, this time in, 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 in Pakistan. It also included trips to Quetta. Um, and I, I noticed one of the speakers was from Balochistan, which, uh, you know, what a wonderful part of Pakistan that is. Um, Travel to the Kirtar Mountains in Western Sindh uh, as a guest, actually, of someone that we knew in the Chandio tribe. Um, spent the last couple of years in Hyderabad, close to the Indus River, that river after which is, uh, Sindh is named and which is in some sense is truly the lifeblood of Pakistan. I used to walk, our house was uh, uh, not too far from the river in evenings, just go and watch those sunsets uh, and also get that sense for sin and what sin has meant to Pakistan. Of course, I'm thinking also of those visits to the shrines at places like Bitshah and Sewan Sharif, uh, the Karachi coast, and even a trip toward Umarkot, which is uh, again, one of those stupendous parts of, 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 of Pakistan. Um, I might mention that a few uh, earlier this week, maybe four or five days ago, I got a surprise email it was a guy in Larkana who sent me a photograph and said, my father took this picture 50 years ago, is this you? And it was indeed me and talk about, you know, your life coming together in that kind of way. Uh, but of course I did have to leave Pakistan at the age of 18. I left with two classmates. We said our goodbyes. We hopped on a bus from Peshawar, uh, went to uh, Kabul, Kandahar, Herat, Tehran, Tabriz, on into Istanbul and Europe. Um, and that was my goodbye. I, 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 I sort of wondered if I would ever come back to be honest. Um, and I later wrote a book about this called Some Far and Distant Place. Uh, and somebody asked me, they said, Some Far and Distant, is that because Pakistan was far from America or America was far from Pakistan? And I kind of don't know which one it is, uh, but I thought of thinking of our second speaker that uh, it was me going back as, I know that, uh, you know, sort of questions of identity, you have uh, Pakistani Americans, uh, which is a large number over time. Uh, the American Pakistanis are a smaller number, uh, but I've often thought in those, ter in those terms, and I think that both of us have been able to, um, in some sense, bridge these, uh, these, these what some people think are, are big differences. Uh, in any case, uh, I did return to Pakistan sooner than I thought. About three years later, I had a scholarship from Northwestern to come back, and uh, this was an undergraduate scholarship and basically took me to Islamabad, to Qadi Azim University. And I did a paper, it was a self-study actually about um, relations between Pakistan and the Middle East. Um, and again, not to go into the details, that later became the, uh, uh, that later became the, uh, uh, the theme of my, of my dissertation. Uh, so again, talking about steps building on, the other, on other things, this was an undergraduate paper, uh, but it also later became my, um, uh, my, 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 my dissertation. Um, I do remember coming back at that time. Uh, I, I, I took a trip. I stopped briefly in the Middle East. After all, that was one of the themes. Uh, but I got into Karachi. Um, and of course, what I often do is I like to travel by land rather than by air. Uh, and I took the train up. And I still remember the sights, sounds, and smells that uh, after being three years away, I think the most powerful um, things that you have are what you experience as a, uh, as a kid growing up and make first came back very strongly. I remember on that platform in Karachi and that familiar chai chai, garam garam chai, chai chai, garam garam chai, which really made me think I am back in Pakistan. 
And it was a wonderful experience in all kinds of ways. Um, and again, uh, that later formed the basis for my, uh, uh, for, 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 for my PhD dissertation. Um, unexpectedly, that was at Northwestern University. Then my graduate school was at Tufts. And I also got a chance to come back. I saw the sign on the wall that said, um, uh, Berkeley Urdu language program in Pakistan, in Lahore, as a matter of fact. And uh, it was a 10 week Urdu language program. And I applied, um, I'll be honest, I had mercenary, mom, uh, mercenary, ultra, uh, mercenary um, reasons. This was basically my free ticket back to Pakistan. Uh, and I did come back, it was only 10 weeks. It was in Shadman colony. Um, uh, we were put in different houses and remarkably the house that I stayed in uh, was the sister of the renowned Urdu novelist Kudrat Alan Haider. I don't know if you've read her book, um, Ag Kaderiya, River of Fire, uh, but I think it's one of the classics of uh, Urdu literature. And I think what a privilege it was to actually spend 10 weeks uh, with, her, with, you know, with, 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 with her sister. Um, so that was, uh, you know, two and then uh, two trips back uh, after my childhood. Now we're on to chapter four, which was actually one of those shorter ones. I guess I mentioned Mother May I, I suppose a baby step. It was very short, it was only three weeks. Um, by now I was a junior officer at uh, USAID. Um, this was in 1984. Uh, the numbers of refugees in Pakistan were increasing every year. What was dominating the, uh, uh, the, the television at the time uh, was actually the famine in Ethiopia. And in an international global sense, the UN and other, other, other agencies were concerned that um, was Afghanistan going to experience something similar in terms of the famine? Uh, and in those pictures actually, this, they were from Africa, but they kind of were concerned. And so I was sort of the junior guy on this little trip uh, sent out obviously with government approval and uh, you know, they, they provided our itinerary uh, and it, it basically involved interviewing um, uh, re interviewing Afghan refugees that were coming out in Peshawar, in Bajor and other places. Uh, and it was fascinating. It was nice to come back in some sense, perhaps in a constructive role. Um, we did conclude that Afghanistan was in a difficult situation, uh, but it was not a, um, uh, it, 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 it was not a, uh, a famine on the lines of what, I, of what Ethiopia was experiencing. Um, but it kind of, I suppose, also got me into the development field too. Um, what, happens, uh, what happens next is the, is the chapter five in returning to Pakistan as an aid officer. That was a pretty long chapter uh, and certainly affected my life in all kinds of ways. Um, but I came back this time, it was for four years. This was a training. I was the, again, the junior person on the block. I just joined uh, as a foreign service officer. Um, it was a wonderful thing. And I might say that um, my colleagues said, how on earth was your first aid assignment in Pakistan, you know, a country you were at least somewhat familiar with, you know, why didn't they send you to Bolivia or Nigeria or something like that? Because that's the way bureaucracies tend to do. Um, but I did get that experience of coming. My first assignment was in a country I was familiar with. And it was, uh, again, I feel very fortunate when I look back and, and, and see that. Um, it was a big aid program at the time. Um, I, I, one of the things that since coming back to Foreman, I talked to uh, Dr. Kasor Malik, and he's mentioned to me that um, some of those scholarships that aid provided at the time helped establish the biotech industry in Pakistan. And of course, we worked actually with some of the ag universities and the um, Peshawar, Faslabad, Jamshora, with uh, Park and NARC as well. Um, in some sense, it was the start of my uh, professional life. Um, but I'll also say it marked the beginning of real personal changes. Uh, and this gets into something people could talk about, about the balance between the personal and the professional. Uh, before, uh, before coming to Salabad, people would say, well, where, where are you headed? What's your first assignment as a foreign service officer? And I would say, I'm going to Islamabad. And the line there was Islamabad, very little social life, no chance of romance. So that was the guiding, part, the guiding uh, advice I got. And uh, you have to know that uh, I've spent my life trying to prove other people wrong. And I've also spent my life trying to break stereotypes. And so uh, not long after I uh, arrived, I met Miss Fiona Riak, who was a teacher at the British school in Islamabad. And not too many weeks later, uh, we were engaged and uh, it's, um, we were married seven months after we met and it's proved to be a lifetime enduring relationship with three kids that I might briefly mention, uh, but she fortunately shared my sense of adventure. And in those four years, uh, we explored everything from the Pasu Peaks uh, north of Hunza to other places. Uh, and this was not a five-star hotel kind of arrangement. Sometimes it was under a tent. Sometimes we were riding on a motorcycle. Um, I'm a bit of a tightwad. Some people say mucky chus, as they say. Uh, they, they, uh, that, that was part of it too. So we stay in tea shops sometime and it's all cool and wonderful. Uh, when we left Pakistan at the time, 
uh, we, we went to the travel office and we said, we want to buy the ticket from Rawalpindi to Karachi. We want this last look at the whole length of Pakistan. They said, what? You want to go by train? Anyway, we hopped the train and we got that 24 hour journey across uh, Pakistan. And I will say now we're up to 1989. My thoughts as I looked out that window as Punjab going past and then upper Sindh with its date trees, um, I am the luckiest person in the world. This too is part of my life. I've been privileged to live it. This too has made me what I am today. Um, so again, another brief chapter, the 90s we're at right now. Now the kids have come along. Uh, we wanna introduce them to this country that's meant so much to us. And um, believe it or not, uh, we went, when we were in Sana, when we were in Pretoria, when we were in Almaty, when we were in Amman, we get a vacation. If you're in, I think the Pakistan Foreign Service probably has that too. You get a trip every two years and our trips are always to Pakistan. And uh, our travel office would say, what, you're going again to Pakistan? So in the 90s, we actually went back four times and took different vacations. Uh, none of these were, uh, were official, um, but they did take us to some wonderful places as you can appreciate in, uh, in Pakistan. In fact, I think there's no way to better express my, my, my I'll call it love for Pakistan than the fact that we took so many vacations there uh, in the early years of our marriage. Uh, now we're in the sort of the final chapter before here, and this was the unlikely one to uh, come back. I had been a junior officer in, at the aid mission. I was going to come back as mission director. I was in Cambodia at the time. There was that October 2005 earthquake that killed 80,000 Pakistanis, uh, leaving another 3 million homeless. It was a terrible event, uh, but it was also an event that drew Pakistan together and indeed drew the international community. I know relationships among countries, between countries are like a roller coaster, uh, but something like this happened and, and, and it really was a rewarding time to be there, uh, to be responsible for that program that was supposed to build back better. And indeed we did build uh, in cooperation with our counterparts. Uh, one of them, of course, being uh, General Nadine, who at that time was head of the Pakistan Earthquake Relief and Reconstruction Agency. Uh, he was a, uh, led the Pakistan effort. And of course, because we were involved, had a good relationship with him. He was actually an army helicopter pilot and we'd fly up sometimes to the Northern areas, uh, which again was rewarding in every which way that you can imagine. I did visit Foreman. Uh, that was the start of our relationship. Uh, uh, they, they were building uh, private equipment and later built Hope Towers. Um, Peter Armacost asked me to dinner or the lunch I should say as a aid mission director. And so unbelievably I, had dinner in the house that's now my dining room here. And at the time, I couldn't imagine I would ever return to Pakistan. Um, and yet, uh, I did have that chance to return and, uh, you know, feel so grateful for it. Um, gave that speech as I was leaving after that very memorable year, which also involved a lot of travel. That was the first time I got to, uh, uh, to, to, to Macron and to um, other places in the southwest of, uh, of, of Gwadar and other places as well, um, you know, to add to some of the other trips that we had taken. Uh, and so, again, said my goodbyes, as I always do, is this the last time? Is this the last time I'll be in Pakistan? But I did hold out that hope to my colleagues. I said, I'm not sure there may be one more tra chapter of my life to spend here. Um, so I did go on to those other, uh, you know, other eight years later. I retired, retired in January 2017. I taught for a couple of years at my hometown university, um, kept up with what was happening, was in, engaged to some extent with the friends of Foreman, uh, always had a place place in my heart for it. Um, but again, I got the call to come back here and felt uh, felt really fortunate. Um, relatively recent, uh, there was the inauguration not too many, about three months ago, I suppose. And one of the pastors said, uh, told me afterwards, he said, Jonathan, this is the hardest job you'll ever have. Uh, and he might be right. I'm not sure. We'll see about that. But it's, it's a challenge. Um, but it's also it's also a wonderful challenge. Uh, of course, it's tough to come in the middle of the, of the pandemic. Uh, but I'm delighted to be here, uh, delighted to have this opportunity. I think our first speaker said, or maybe it was our second, I always wanted to be involved in a TED, TED Talk. This is the first for me as well. So uh, here it is on the, on, the, on the screen because of COVID-19. There, there were a couple of ways I was going to end, but I think what I'll end is something I say in this book, Some Far and Distant Place, is that uh, growing up in Pakistan gave me a life that was filled with wonder and astonishment. Um, if I had written it again, this was written quite a few years ago, I would have added gratitude to that list. Uh, and I think when I look at life, this sort of combination of gratitude, wonder, and astonishment is really important. Uh, people can choose how they look at life. And, and, and uh, again, there's, um, you know, I, I haven't, I mean, I could go into some of the challenges and I mentioned some of the life and death experiences and other things that affect and shape your life. But what they do is they, they show you how precious it is. And, you know, rather than lessening this notion of wonder and, and, and astonishment, even gratitude, uh, they heighten it. So I'll finish with, um, Kind of like the way I started, I, I used this a couple of days ago for the first time, but I thought, hey, that's a nice way to talk. Um, attitude toward life, wah, wah. 
How fantastic is that? Those were the words I heard in, at a uh, Mashara given by Fez Ahmed Fez at Boston University. Uh, and when I heard them read that Urdu poetry, I thought, fantastic. I had, this was in graduate school, so it was quite a long time ago, but wah wah. And then I thought I had the privilege, of course, to serve in Mongolia. And you may not know, but the expression there that you hear around a campfire on the Mongolian steppe, and you imagine the nomads all those years ago, the Mongolian troopers, of course, getting ready for battle, I suppose, but they're sitting around the fire and their words are za, za. Sounds a bit like wah wah to me. Uh, and then the final comment, of course, is wow, wow. And I have got to think, I'm waiting for the linguist to tell me it's true that wah wah was the origins of the English word wow, wow. And that to this day is my attitude toward life. Wow, wow, aren't we lucky to have this years on planet Earth. So thank you, thank you very much.